May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Have you ever been a participant in what someone might call a mountaintop experience? Now, this would be a, a happening or an event that seems to lift you up beyond this realm into a whole other level. You might even consider it life-changing. You went and you took part. You didn't fully anticipate what would happen. You, you didn't know how you were going to respond. And then you returned with a change of heart or maybe a new perspective on things. One of my mountaintop experiences was in the spring of 1997 when I joined about 30 of the men of my congregation and attended the Promise Keepers event held in the old Astrodome in Houston, Texas. It was a three-day event attended by over 80,000 men. And what made it such a great event for me was that it provided one of those what-if moments. As I was in the midst of this great throng of Christian men, I was awed by the idea of the universal church and the impact of our witness to the world if we could simply all come together for the sake of Jesus. What if we could set aside our differences and unite in a gospel-centered endeavor? There were some great speakers with powerful presentations, all set to the soundtrack of inspirational music. But some became sidetracked as they began issuing invitations and altar calls. And others were starstruck by the dignitaries that were present, such as Tony Evans and Colin Powell and the former President George Bush. The what-if moment passed. Still, I felt like I had been to a mountaintop experience that left me aching for more. Well, this morning's Gospel reading records a literal mountaintop experience for Peter, James, and John. We turn our attentions back to Matthew chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces, were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Again, the word of God. Now, there's a couple of things I'd like for us to look at quickly to set the context of this all. First of all, tra transfiguration takes place six days, which follows the end of the previous chapter, chapter 16. In chapter 16, for instance, we read of Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, to which then Jesus attaches the promise, and I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. From there, Jesus goes on to speak of his upcoming crucifixion. And he has to turn right around and chastise Peter when Peter tries to talk him out of it. The Lord admonishes him, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then he continues teaching, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross 
and follow me. You see, through this whole chapter, we find Jesus attempting to prepare his disciples for the troubling events that were about to unfold before him. Rejection, injustice, torture, crucifixion. His was not going to be an easy road. Now, the second thing we need to take note of is that Jesus doesn't take all of his disciples with him to witness his transfiguration. He only invites Peter, James, and John. Some might think, well, were these guys better, greater disciples than the others? No, they really weren't. For Jews, the truth of matter required the witness of at least two or three others. Peter, James, and John were the three who would go on to testify about Jesus. James, when he was later seized and murdered by Herod Agrippa. John, his brother, who would write the book of Revelation and describe the heavenly glory of Jesus. And Peter, who writes of Jesus' glory in his second letter, which is from today's epistle reading, where he writes... For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. As we see, Peter may have struggled to understand what was going on in the moment, but he would eventually figure things out, guided and taught by the Holy Spirit. And so Peter, James, and John accompany Jesus up a high mountain, again, a literal mountaintop experience. And there Jesus was transfigured. That is, his entire being was changed. He didn't just appear differently. He was different as his divine nature was revealed to them. The Greek word here is where we get the English word metamorphosis, a changing of something into something different. We all can think about the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. What is part of the caterpillar's DNA is also in the butterfly that emerges from the cocoon, right? Well, from his human nature, the disciples watch in disbelief as Jesus' divine nature is revealed to them. And then Moses and Elijah appear with him, talking with him. And the disciples are starstruck. Lord, it's good that we are here. I mean, the whole of the Bible's words and prophecies were standing right there before them. Moses, the lawgiver, Elijah, faithful prophet of the old, and Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God, as Peter had confessed just six days before. Mark tells us in his account, Peter was sort of babbling on, for he did not know what to say. You know, the disciples had heard Jesus speak. They had watched him heal people. They had seen him perform miracles. But what they were looking at, what they were beholding, was way beyond their wildest imaginations. And at the same moment, they became sidetracked. If you wish, I'll make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. They wanted to build monuments for the elder statesmen of the faith. This was a miracle. This was an unbelievable moment. And they wanted to commemorate it for all time to come. But you know what? This is also one of those rare times when God himself spoke to the disciples. Again, they'd heard Jesus speak. They had followed him. But God decides to place his exclamation mark on his son. Now, God was not disrespecting or disparaging his faithful servants, Moses and Elijah, but he does seem to find fault with the disciples' thinking and reactions. Peter is in mid-sentence when a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the crowd said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God the Father shifted the spotlight directly onto his son, basically telling them, 
pay attention to him. Moses had been sent by God to effect the rescue of Israel from their Egyptian bondage. He'd been used by God to teach the people about their life in the promised land to come, honored by God as being his lawgiver. Elijah was a prophet to the people at a time when they had turned away from God and followed false gods. Through his words, God called to the people to repent even as he worked through Elijah to show his power and his majesty against these false gods the people had turned toward. Jesus was more important than that. Jesus would change things. He would change sinners into saints by taking their place under the law. He would change the world's hopelessness and despair into a new land of promise and joy in eternity. He could offer what only Moses and Elijah could only long for. He loved enough to rescue without protest. He cared enough to live the life of a human being so that you could be able to live in heaven. He died willingly to pay the price for your sin. Jesus' life, death, resurrection are perpetually celebrated even as his name is eternally honored. Thus, God would have us all pay attention to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces, were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them and saying, rise and have no fear. The Lord who had revealed to them his full nature comforts them, touches them, encourages them, us, all of humankind. Rise, have no fear. Those are his words to whom we're supposed to pay attention. Have no fear in your sin and your shame and your guilt, Jesus would say. For I've taken all that stuff and put it on me for the sake of your salvation. Have no fear. For the wages of sin may be death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in me, your Lord and Savior. Pay attention to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand, the throne of God. There are so many competing voices that demand our attention in the world. Pay attention to Jesus. There are all kinds of people saying all kinds of things that make you shake your head, make you put your tongue in cheek, accept things with a grain of salt. Pay attention to Jesus. And there may be all kinds of wonders and all kinds of seeming miracles that are around us that sidetrack us. And there may be things and people toward whom we become starstruck. Pay attention to Jesus. For he is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So I offer up this prayer from our hymn, Swiftly Past the Clouds of Glory. Pray with me. Lord, transfigure our perception with the purest light that shines and recast our life's intentions to the shape of your designs till we seek no other glory than what lies past Calvary's hill and our living and our dying and our rising by your will. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please rise.